and welcome to Game Sec. This time around, we're talking about some piss poor ports. <laughs> you know, Joe, sometimes ports work out pretty good, but in the games that we're showing, not so much. There, for various reasons, there's something wrong with these games, and you're going to find out why. Indeed, let's get to it. Castlevania Symphony of the Night on the PlayStation is one of my favorite Castlevania games. You play as Dracula's son Alucard whom you might remember from Castlevania 3. This was the first Metroidvania style Castlevania game and they pulled it off extremely well. As you advance through the castle you gain new items and abilities to open up other areas and so on. Fantastic 2D graphics and an amazing soundtrack made this game an instant classic. You know, I was always kind of sad that such a great 2D game was made for the PlayStation instead of the Saturn. I mean, the Saturn is supposed to be a 2D monster, right? Well, my wish was kind of granted the next year with Akumajo Dracula X Nocturne in the Moonlight for the Saturn, which was only released in Japan. I imported this right away, even though I had already played through the PlayStation import. I mean, come on, it's now on the Saturn. It's gotta be incredible. Wow, it really isn't. To say I was disappointed is an understatement. Right off the bat when you start the game, you'll notice little bits of slowdown as you move up the stairs for the first fight. In fact, this game has a ton of slowdown in almost every single stage. Look at the rotating clouds in the background here. It can't even maintain a smoothly rotating motion, even though the only other thing that's going on on screen is the slow drawing of text. And that's pretty damn sad. Honestly, the entire game seems to be running slightly slower than the PlayStation version as a whole. There really is no excuse for this at all, but that is only the start of the problems. Gone are most of the transparencies. See these green blobs? They're a dithered mesh here in the Saturn game. Hell, they're not even transparent in the PlayStation version, what gives? I'm not sure why they even bothered to try to mimic some of the transparencies with dithering. I mean, don't you think this giant skull would look better if it was completely opaque rather than faked transparency? I think it'd look really cool if it was solid. They did, however, leave the transparencies intact for this boss fight. In fact, it looks really good. I really wish more of the game was up to these standards. There's also a lot more loading now, oftentimes where there was none before. And it doesn't preload the next area as you run through these rooms anymore. The worst part is that the menu and the map screens actually need to load. Instead of simply pressing the select button like in the PlayStation game, the only way to view the map here is to load the menu and then press the L button, which then loads the map screen. And let me tell you, this makes it extremely painful to check the map. Some of the graphics are also slightly different here and there if you look closely. It's more than just the missing transparencies, the graphics are noticeably more chunky. I mean, look at the stairs on the Saturn version compared to the PlayStation version. On the Saturn, it's not a perfectly diagonal line. And that's because the resolution of the game is different on the two consoles, the Saturn version is actually stretched. The PlayStation version has lower resolution, but that's what this game was designed for and that's where it looks best. Overall, it's a really rushed and crappy port and the Saturn is capable of so much more than this. This was done by Konami's team in Nagoya and that's not where they keep their best talent. However, they did add a few things to help soften the blow of the piss poor port. For example, there's a couple of new small areas to explore in the main game. Granted, these new areas aren't really anything tremendously special. In fact, it doesn't even really feel like they fit in with the rest of the game. It's like editing a scene from Star Trek into Star Wars, it just doesn't work. There's also some new enemies, a couple of new boss encounters, and stuff like that. Also, both Richter and Maria are playable from the beginning of the game. Neither of them has a story like Alucard does. They also don't level up or get increased abilities, but you can save their progress. Maria wasn't playable in the PlayStation version at all. This is nice, I guess, but this game really wasn't designed to be played with these types of characters. It was designed to be played with Alucard. It just feels weird playing these types of stages with these characters. Overall, I recommend the PlayStation version tenfold. Even Koji Igarashi has denounced this version and has no official legacy in the Castlevania family. Konami, you let us Saturn owners down big time. Well, actually not all Saturn owners. There's a lot of people out there who prefer this game as they feel it's more complete. After all, this game is still incredibly fun. In fact, I ended up playing for over seven hours just to capture footage for this episode because I had a very hard time putting it down.
Let's take a look at the first Tony Hawk's Pro Skater on the PlayStation. This title came out in 1999, and being fairly obsessed with skateboarding when I was growing up, I bought it hoping it would be fun. Well, the game is definitely fun, and I was hooked right from the beginning. It's the right mix of great gameplay and a great soundtrack. Well, I thought the soundtrack was good, but if you're not into punk music, then you probably won't care for it. For me, it was perfect, and I spent hours at a time playing, even though I've beaten the game several times. This title was also ported to the Nintendo 64, but due to a severe lack of memory, it had to be dumbed down quite a bit to make it work. Let's compare the two games and see how bad it really is. When you boot up the PlayStation version, you get a great intro video showing off all the skaters that are in the game. The video is just small highlight clips that are meant to get you excited about the game, and it definitely does that. In the N64 version, well, there's no FMV at all. Instead, you get treated to in-game footage of each skater being controlled by probably one of the game designers. Hell, for all we know, this could be Miyamoto playing. Even with the thought of him playing, it does nothing at all to get you excited about the game. Next, let's take a look at the soundtrack. In the PlayStation version, you're able to skate to 10 different songs, and there's 13 if you own the PAL version. Not all the songs are amazing, but a good 70% of them I do like and they fit the action perfectly. These are complete songs and as far as I know, only one song by the Dead Kennedys was censored. Again, the N64 version got murdered. There's more than a few songs missing from the soundtrack. Some of them are full songs with lyrics and others are just instrumental versions and these loop about every 30 seconds, which is a bit annoying. Another cool feature that I like about the PlayStation version is that some of the levels have video monitors that play the music video of the song that you're skating to. This was cool, although I never really stopped to watch the video being on a time limit and all. The N64 version, of course, has whatever this graphic is just sitting there. And finally, when you beat the game in the PlayStation version, you're rewarded with the highlight reel of the skater you just beat the game with, which was always really impressive. But wait, there's even more! You also get a bonus video showing bales of random skaters. Ooh, that's gotta hurt! In the Nintendo version, you're rewarded with the credits and nothing else. Okay, so this port is just bad because it doesn't have the CD extras? Well, there's other differences too. Believe it or not, the draw distance is actually a bit shorter on the N64 version. This is 64 bits, and the PlayStation is only a wimpy 32 bits. That's only half as powerful. Or is it? Well, not really. So everything was mapped to the C buttons. The A and B buttons were not used at all in this game. Even though that sounds really weird, I did not have a problem with this. In the end, the N64 version is still completely playable and it controls just as well as any version out there. The problem is you're only getting part of what the overall package is and in my opinion that sucks. If you have the N64 version, then sell it and get any of the disc-based versions out there to play this game in its full glory. Golden Axe is a fantastic hack and slash beat em up from Sega. Dave loves this game, but screw him, I'm talking about it. Released in the arcades in 1989, this two player game let you choose from three different warriors. It's really fun slashing up your enemies, knocking them on the helmet, and then tossing them away. You can also collect magic from stupid little elves or whatever they are. The more full your magic meter, the more powerful attack you can do. These damage all the enemies on the screen and are really fun to use. The game's setting is awesome as well. I mean, who didn't love discovering that they were fighting on the back of a giant turtle? Or flying on the back of a great, great eagle? Everybody loved it. The music is also really good and it definitely fits the game. The action is really fun and you should go out right now and buy the arcade cabinet at a garage sale near you. The Genesis got a great port later that year. I mean, it was pretty close despite being only a 4 megabit cartridge. Almost everything was here, just scaled back a little. There's fewer frames of animation, the music is in mono, the voices and screams are also severely weakened, but it still played just as well. They even added a couple of extra stages that the arcade version was too weak to handle, and that is a pretty cool bonus. <laughs> Even the Master System got its own port a few months later. It's not too bad considering the hardware. Yeah, you can only play as a sword dude, but you can choose which magic you want to use. The characters are pretty big and there's no flicker anywhere in the game at all. It's not perfect, but it could be a lot worse. And 
speaking of a lot worse, the PC Engine also got a port of Golden Axe on CD. This one was made by Telenet, and this is the piss poor port. This system, as most of you know, is called the TurboGrafx-16 here in the US and was marketed as a competitor for the Genesis. Yet somehow this version manages to be far, far worse. Firstly, as you can see, the game takes place in a very small window. On top of that, the characters are all tiny and there's never more than three enemies on screen at once. The backgrounds are sparsely detailed with only a few colors and unique tiles on screen at any given time. Yet, despite all of these graphical cutbacks, the game still somehow manages to have insane amounts of slowdown at times. The gameplay itself is just awful. I often found it difficult to get my character to face the correct direction before I attacked. You no longer even get to butt the end of your weapon against enemies' helmets. Or even throw enemies. When you knock an enemy down, they get back up immediately, which makes dealing with a bunch of them a huge pain in the ass. If you're attacking one enemy, another one will run up behind you and quickly put a stop to that. It's also sometimes difficult to tell if you're on the same plane as an enemy, which you need to be for your attacks to work. Your magic attacks are here, and the screen turns black when you use them. The PC Engine should really be able to do this without turning the screen black, you know? There's also some changes in the stages themselves. Remember the two Stage 1 boss guys that come out of this door in the arcade and Genesis versions? Well, not here. In fact, nobody's in there at all. Remember this Night Boss? Well, he's not in this one either. I guess they couldn't work out a contract. I don't know. Maybe the CDs just don't have enough memory to load a night sprite. Sad to say, that probably is the case here due to the limited RAM of early system cards. Sometimes cartridges actually hold advantages over CDs. Speaking of being on CD, this game has to have some awesome cutscenes, right? Well, it has cutscenes, but they're far from awesome. They're very slow-paced, small, and honestly quite boring. Each character has their own backstory as an intro, but that's as neat as it gets. And no matter which character you choose, you're in for a bad time. Even the music is a letdown if you can believe that. I mean, it's not absolutely horrible or anything, but the synth is extremely thin and almost cheap sounding. I'd honestly rather listen to the arcade or even the Genesis music. And lastly, are the sound effects. It sounds like an Atari 2600 game and that is being polite. I mean, what the hell? Seriously, do yourself a favor and don't import this one unless you must have all things Golden Axe. You know, I'm gonna force Dave to play this one someday just because I'm an ass. All right, a couple things. I feel sorry for the people that actually bought Tony Hawk for the N64 because they're not getting the full experience of the PlayStation version. And secondly, being the Castlevania nut, <laughs> I never bought the Saturn version. Indeed, being and you collect everything Castlevania and you don't have the Saturn version. I am crazy. And yes. now it's going for a lot of money. Yeah, I wish I would have bought it. You're an Damn. idiot. Anyway, we've got more games to show you, so just sit back and enjoy. Here's the instant classic, Contra 3 The Alien Wars by Konami for everyone's favorite system, the Super Nintendo. The first two games on the NES were very special, and from the moment I started playing this game in 1992, I had that same feeling. The feeling that I was playing something very, very special. I played this game constantly by myself and with another good friend who isn't Cho. The cool thing about this game was that it was hard. It wasn't unfair, but it challenged you constantly while you're playing, and every time we play, we'd get a little bit further. Then finally one day you beat it and wow is that a great feeling. This is an amazing sequel and builds on top of the solid foundation that were the NES games. The graphics are beautiful with great use of color and each stage has its own feel to it. The bosses are huge, both mechanical and organic and are really fun to kill. They've taken plenty of my life since I've owned this game so beating them was always pure satisfaction. Being able to wield two different weapons is a huge step up in gameplay. Each weapon is very useful on certain enemies, but my favorites are the spread shot and the crush gun. They're truly a lethal combination. And if dual weapons wasn't enough, you had the M80,000 Helio Bomb that would devastate everything on screen, except for bosses, of course. Then there's the overhead mode 7 levels where the whole stage would rotate with the push of a shoulder button. I've always liked these stages, but I feel I'm in the minority as most people don't seem to care for them. And of course, you have one of the better Contra soundtracks out there with lots of memorable tunes.
Four years later, Konami decided to port this title to the Game Boy Advance, which seemed like a smart thing to do. But for some reason, things were left out of this version, and I scratch my head and wonder why. The first and most notable thing missing is the lack of dual weapons. I'm not sure why this feature was removed, but it wasn't good. Now you can just juggle the icons on screen until they disappear, so you're not stuck with one when you'd rather have the other if there's only two icons to pick up. But this is no consolation. The dual weapons really made the gameplay stand out, and actually added a bit of strategy. They also decided to take away the M80,000 Helio Bomb! Now this isn't that big of a deal, but on the SNES version, I used to use this weapon all the time and I do miss it. The collision detection also sucks. Your hitbox feels a whole lot bigger than the Super Nintendo version, and it's easy to die from something you don't seem to actually touch. And now they use the power of the Game Boy Advance to make sure that enemies are constantly entering the screen non-stop at all times, and this can be annoying. They did add a password feature here though, even though the game only has six stages. Speaking of stages, level 2 and 5 on the original game were the top-down Mode 7 levels. On the Game Boy Advance version, they were taken out and replaced with a couple of side-scrolling levels from Contra Hardcore on the Genesis. They don't fit in extremely well because the Genesis Contra is a lot grittier than Contra 3. The Game Boy Advance is capable of Mode 7, so why remove these levels? As I said before, I really like these levels, and they broke up the side-scrolling gameplay perfectly just like the alternative stages in the first two Contra games. And then there's the music, which is the same soundtrack as the Super Nintendo with one minor difference. It sounds HORRIBLE! I'm pretty sure there was a car horn sample on their keyboard that they took full advantage of. I'm serious, it sounds like a bunch of car horns. So as you can see, there are quite a bit of changes to this port. The game is still playable, and it is fun, but as far as a port goes, it missed by a mile. Streets of Rage 2 on the Genesis is one of the best beat-em-ups ever, if not THE best. It's one of the few games in the genre that I don't get bored playing due to the repetition. And that might be because of the great graphics, the incredible music, and the really tight gameplay. It feels good to beat up on your enemies, and the game is sometimes crazy like having an alien encounter in the middle of an amusement park. I don't really understand why this is here, but it's fun, so I don't complain. It's got four characters to choose from, some cool rotation effects, and definitely plenty of action. And of course, Yuzo Koshiro's soundtrack really makes you want to keep playing, and it's among the best works that he's ever done. Oh, and of course, two players can play at the same time if you want. Seriously, you can't go wrong with this one, and it's reason enough to own a Genesis. <laughs> But then, Streets of Rage 2 was ported to the Master System. First, you can only choose from three characters this time instead of four. Max is gone. It's also only a single player game this time around. Now that right there is fine by me, but it'd bother a lot of other people I imagine. I don't need to be around other people all the time, so I'm good just playing with myself. Or, you know what I mean. This would be good if this were the game's biggest problems, but it definitely is not. I mean, for one, just look at it. The characters are super tiny. It's really hard to make out what's going on, even if we zoom in here. You're not sure if you've grabbed an enemy or if they've grabbed you. If you get knocked down, they can start pounding on you the instant you get back up, which is very frustrating. The controls are also a bit messed up in their timing. The special moves are mostly here, but they're a lot harder to do. And everything seems to move really fast for their small size, and I feel that it interferes with how the game plays. It's hard to get into any kind of rhythm. Yuzo Koshiro also did the music for this port, and it's okay. It could definitely be worse, but it's not as good as a lot of other Master System games. Now, you might be saying, Joe, you're an idiot. Of course it's going to be way worse on the Master System. It's an 8-bit console, whereas the Genesis was 16-bit. What do you expect, dumbass? Well, look how the port of Streets of Rage 1 turned out on that same system the very same year. It's way better than Part 2, and although not as good as the Genesis version, it's still a very good port, all things considered. I mean, it's pretty damned impressive, don't you think? And now back to Streets of Rage 2. This is quite a downgrade from the first game. Oh, oh, and in the Genesis version, it's like boo. In the Master System version, it's not, and that is completely unacceptable. In the Genesis game, you do baseball. You don't do baseball at all in the Master System port. I mean, how can anyone even take this seriously? In fact, most of the stages are restructured, rearranged, or completely missing. 
This was never released in the US on the console, and yeah, I'm okay with that. Finally, let's take a look at Outrunners from Sega. This was a glorious 1992 arcade game that you'd often find up linked with another Outrunners machine for multiplayer action. As for the game itself, it's basically Outrun on steroids with lots of new stages and tons of branching paths. It's also really, really fast. Unless you're playing in multiplayer mode, the only thing you need to worry about is racing the clock, not where you place. The graphics are definitely pleasing to my eyeballs with tons of color and great scaling. Overall, it's a great follow-up to Outrun even though it wasn't a direct sequel. But then two years later in 1994, Outrunners came home to the Genesis. And honestly, I don't even know why they bothered. This version forces you to play in split screen even in single player mode and I do not appreciate that one bit. As a result, the graphics are all very small and not very detailed at all. And in case you're wondering, player one is on top. You can still choose your stage, but since the game forces you to play with either an AI opponent or a second player, you may not always be the one who gets to choose. The first player to the checkpoint is actually the one who chooses. In single player, it definitely shouldn't be that way. The stages themselves seem mostly intact, but scaled back drastically. Though even if this weren't an arcade game, it still looks pretty bad for the console. The music doesn't sound too bad, and some of it is actually kind of good. What's not good though are the sound effects. You're constantly bombarded with very annoying and very scratchy sounds which are hard to tell what they're supposed to be. They did add an original mode here where you race one area at a time and then come back to this screen to move on to the next, and it's not tremendously exciting. The saddest part is that this was a late release for the console. They should have just waited a year or two and released it on the Saturn instead. This is Jack Ryan Radio for the Dreamcast, developed by Sega's Smilebit. I absolutely loved this game when it was released in 2000, and the refreshing new gameplay was just what I needed. As weird as it sounds, Sega was really winning me over with their new IPs for the Dreamcast, and this title was way up on that list. I love the whole idea of skating around and covering up other gangs' graffiti with your own art. The control was really good, and there was never a problem grinding on rails or collecting the spray paint cans that are littered throughout the level. Evading the police also added a sense of urgency while playing. I mean, when you're tagging the side of a building or vehicle, you have to go through the controller motions to complete the tag. Some of these require quite a bit of input, and you know the cops are coming up right behind you and will try to tackle you at any second. Then there's that head of the police named Onishima who keeps trying to shoot at you with his long-barreled pistol. The tags that you would spray are pretty cool, and you can even collect new ones throughout the levels, or you can even make your own design. I have no art skill, so I was always using the in-game tags. This is also probably why I never pursued being a graffiti artist in real life. No skills. Also, not a big fan of vandalism either. Arguably, the best part about this game is the soundtrack. There's a long list of tracks and all of them are perfect for playing this game. I wonder if real graffiti artists listen to this type of music. The cell shaded graphics look great and gave the game a very cartoony look. Playing this game again for this review just reminded me of how much fun I used to have with this title. A few years later, Vicarious Visions got a wild idea and decided to port this game to the Game Boy Advance. These guys have had some experience before with ports to the Game Boy Advance that have actually worked really well. Tony Hawk's Pro Skater 2 comes to mind, and even though it's isometric, it's for the most part very enjoyable. They use the same engine for Jet Grind Radio, which again is isometric, and this is where the first problem comes in. For some reason, controlling your character is ridiculously hard. The isometric view really makes it hard to judge platforms and rails and just about everything in here. As with the original game, there's a time limit to complete all of your tags. It's never been an issue until now because it's just so difficult to get your character to make jumps that you'll be doing them over and over and just keep falling. Persistence will get you there, but damn it shouldn't be this hard. Like here, I know there's a spot that I have to tag, but I just can't figure out how to get there. The graphics seem to blend into each other and I just can't find a way. 
The music fits perfect here because, like it says, I don't understand what's going on here. I don't understand what's going on here. And it's true, I just can't understand. Speaking of music, Vicarious Visions did the best they could possibly do, but sadly it's not enough. There's not nearly as many tracks as the original games, and they're set to short samples so you hear a lot of repetition in every stage. The stages for the most part are modeled after the Dreamcast version, but they just don't flow very well when you're skating around. That damn isometric view just makes it way too hard. In the end, if you're up for some punishment and just have to have Jet Grind Radio on the go, then maybe this is for you. I can't recommend it though, as it's just too hard to play. So Dave, you like things that are limited to the half screen, like Mario Kart on the Super Nintendo. Do you oh, yeah. like Outrunners on the Genesis? No, because it's a Sega game. I mean, what, why would I? It's on the Genesis. Half but screen, though. Yeah, but it's fine on the Nintendo system. Of course. <laughs> <laughs> so you guys, I'm sure, played some piss poor ports in your lifetime. Uh, any that we didn't mention here that you want to talk about? Yeah, let us know. And in the meantime, thank you, but not you, for watching GameSag. NES port of Marble Madness. This is an awesome port, Joe. I love this. I played this game constantly growing up. It was amazing. Well, what do you think of the 16-bit port on the Sega Genesis from Electronic Arts? I'll tell you what I think of this game. 